Hi, Suzanne. Hi there. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Suzanne Schneider. Uh, you're an historian at the uh, Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. You've written for a number of places people have heard of, like the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, uh, Mother Jones. Uh, perhaps most important for our purposes, you're author of a book we're going to discuss called The Apocalypse and the End of History, Modern Jihad and the Crisis of Liberalism. So uh, no shortage of ambition in that title, The Apocalypse. Yeah, and the end. Congratulations <laughs> on that. <laughs> Thank you. Your publisher was fine with that. You said, I'm going for the long ball. And they said, OK. They, they said, why don't you just talk about everything? That sounds great. Uh -huh, um, good. It's sure to be a runaway bestseller. You did come up with a subtitle. It narrows things down a little. Modern Jihad and the Crisis of Liberalism. But I've got to say, this is it is about much more than jihad. Uh, it is a it, it is a, a comment about the modern world. Uh, yeah. And but I do want to start with jihad uh, because you know, as you're writing the book, kind of the governing paradigm of American national security was global war on terror. Yeah. And that's certainly the context for the writing of the book. Then in the last couple of years, there's been a kind of a shift of emphasis uh, that continues up to this moment, you know, with the war in Ukraine. I mean, as of a couple of years ago, we started moving toward a, a new kind of Cold War stance, it seemed like. There was more and more discussion of the big enemies being Russia and China. I, I guess somewhat less about the big enemy being jihadism. And of course, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that moved the spotlight, I guess, a little away from the global war on terror. Although we should say that, although it hasn't been in the headlines much lately, there is a global, I mean, we have troops. We're, we have ongoing operations in the right. global war on terror, but that's, I mean, it's, it's often been conducted invisibly. That's been kind of one of its hallmarks. Right. Is that it's supposed to be kind of conducted in the shadows and outside of the kind of view of American people and really outside any sort of public scrutiny. And there's a, you know, a, there's a, we can talk about why that is and tactically how that has occurred uh, right. as well. But yes, it is ongoing, even though it is kind of, uh, you know, it fades from the headlines. And, and I wanted to ask you, uh, before we get into jihad, be, because, I mean, you have a whole argument about how, in a certain sense, the global war on terror has been, has rested on some misunderstandings in a certain sense, beginning with a misunderstanding of the concept of jihad and the actual motivating force for uh, is radical Islamist terrorism and so on. But before we get to all that and then zoom back out and yeah. and 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 see it as a larger critique, uh, e even than that, uh, I wanted to ask you, like, how how has it felt uh, as the I'm sure you've been aware that uh, of this shifting focus, this emergence of like Cold War Two as the paradigm? Have you? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, does well, that, is that disorienting for you as somebody? <laughs> no. It's it's not. I mean, right, I'm, a hist I'm a historian. I don't really believe the past repeats. Um, it's uh, it, it seems to be kind of diametrically opposed with everything I've I've actually seen. Even and during the war on terror, it's important to remember that you know there was um, you know there were people speaking at that point about how the war on terror kind of resuscitated a kind of cold war like dualism and binary and had now kind of plopped it down and applied to different settings. Okay. Um, but the reality is that however much this kind of the appeal to like prior historical periods, right, no, no matter what, what work this does to us, it's very appealing because it's familiar to say, aha, this is like what we're going back into. We're never really going back into that. The conditions on the ground are completely different. The material, social, political, economic conditions are completely different. Um, and it's, you know, so I, I have no, um, you know, I, I have no doubt that, the you know, the way that this kind of new Cold War is going to be waged, if that is in fact kind of what's going to happen, uh, is going to be quite different than the old one. And that some of those differences are going to run actually through the war and terror and the kind of broader transformation of violence that I'm tracking here in this book. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that, you know, we don't actually think that we're kind of going to be able to return to the past. I think it's it's just it's it's useful to to understand that and to see that there's something kind of really foundational 
um, happening at the kind of structural level with the kind of question of violence, with warfare. And that is going to mean that the new Cold War, if that occurs, is not going to look like the old one. Okay. Uh, we should kind of adjust our expectations uh, accordingly. Um, okay, and just to touch on one thing you you passed over briefly, it sounds like you do, there is one unifying theme you see between global war and terror and Cold War is a kind of dichotomous view of the world. I mean, maybe Manichaean even. The idea yeah. that there is a a big, pretty unified enemy and it springs in some sense from a single source. Uh, and I mean, kind of famously in the first Cold War, there were there was a tendency to see the threat of communism as more monolithic than it was, you know, yep. that and, and did not appreciate friction between Russia and China. Um, yep. And, and that it sounds like that is something you see as as common to uh, or am I wrong? Well, well, right. Certainly American kind of foreign policy in particular likes to cast itself as um, this kind of, you know, this light uh, that is kind of benevolent. Um, and, and and so there's a kind of always a temptation to cast this in terms of a good versus evil struggle. Mm-hmm. And that was you know true in the Cold War. It was certainly true during the, the global war on terror. Um, yeah, and that often comes with a kind of dismissal of like why our purported enemies do the things that they do, um, and the kind of recourse to psychological explanations in order to explain political behavior. Uh, but things I think are even a little bit different. As this kind of you said, I'm I'm not a I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a a specialist on Russia or China or the kind of you know new emerging um, relations between them, but. Right. We already have this kind of um, something that's quite distinct here, at least during the first Cold War, you had two ostensibly communist countries, even if there was a kind of divide between them. Right. That's not really the order, the world that we encounter right now. Right. We have a kind of uh, communist Chinese uh, uh, kind of communist China. Um, that is itself kind of uh, in, in completely embroiled in the workings of global capitalism and kind of um, and, and, and has kind of developed um, you know, its economy, its standard of living, everything because of that embeddedness in the kind of this global marketplace. And Russia, which is right, uh, a, a, led by a kind of far right kind of nationalist kind of uh, movement and force that absolutely rejects the kind of le- the Soviet legacy of kind of communism. Um, and if you're going to like, you know, place it in, in some sort of kind of continuity, it's not kind of the immediate predecessor of the Soviet Union, but like an older Russian imperial model, I think that's kind of um, more compelling there. So it, we don't, you can't even pretend that we have ideological coherence between these two, you know, kind of uh, uh, behemoths that the U.S. is encountering in this new multipolar universe. So I think that that also is going to change the way that this kind of, um, you know, that, that this kind of war, if it's going to be a war, ensues. And kind of the final thing I'll say about that in terms of like, right, tactics, um, right, Cold War was a lot of proxy wars. All right, we see this in Vietnam. We see this um, kind of you know throughout South Asia. We see this in much of the kind of Middle East and Central Asia. Right? How is China, to the extent that they are kind of um, trying to expand their global influence, how are they doing that? Right? They're already doing that through a completely different means, through infrastructure, through building ports, through really kind of embedding themselves in the kind of again the markets and the the infrastructure of various countries as a way of kind of flexing political and diplomatic muscle. Like this itself is, this is new. Um, this is a, a different kind of mode of exerting one's influence and kind of, you know, pulling people underneath its umbrella. So I'm just really wary of kind of trying, yeah, to, <laughs> casting our present moment or even our future moment uh, kind of into these old paradigms because they often miss the way that things have shifted quite radically on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I should say, I mean, the way we are framing the, uh, the what's being called the new cold war is not us versus capitalism versus communism it's liberal democracy versus autocracy slash authoritarianism which is as its own issues as an accurate uh all-encompassing depiction of the globe but but there is i mean there is that uh there is i guess that attempt to accommodate some of the differences uh i I don't know but But um, i mean but even to that point though right (laughs) <laughs> that framing doesn't map even geographically because right now the battle between authoritarianism and liberal democracy is also being fought domestically in the United States. Um, and that, you know, that we have this kind of, you know, the, the notion that like you even have a single camp, right? The West that kind of is the champion of liberal democracy and it's facing off against these other camps that are 
again, geographically distinct regions or countries which are promoting a different ideological agenda, like that now, that no longer tracks. These things have really, these ideologies have scattered and they've reassembled and those, these kind of disputes between them are often being fought at the domestic level as we see within our own country. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as for um, kind of your your book, uh, yeah. I, I, tell me if I've got, you know, part of the basic idea wrong here. Um, there's this, we, we, we referred to, uh, you know, terrorists who said, who said that they were acting in accordance with Islamic scripture as jihadists. They often invoke that word themselves. Um, you think we, uh, have, have a misunder that, that that word jihad and that whole context, that whole religious context led us to misunderstand the actual motivating forces at work and, and what, what so-called jihadism was actually a symptom of. And you think it was a, a partly a symptom of um, kind of what's wrong with the world we created, we being uh, American champions of, uh, I guess you would say, neoliberalism, of capitalism, of, of, of whatever, right? I mean, the... the, the the, what we call jihadism in a, is in a sense a, a, a symptom of a pathology of, of kind of the modern world. Is that? Well, well, I think more specifically, well, there's a few things. One, right, jihad, I try to kind of lay this out in my book. Right, jihad is a term that has its own history that's, mean really, that's meant really different things over time. Um, and what jihad meant in the kind of early 20th or early 21st century is not what it meant even 100 years prior. Uh, it's not even really what it meant in the 1990s necessarily. Um, and that um, so, you know, part of what my book is trying to do is track how, you know, a, 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 something that we associate with kind of religion or theology actually evolves. Um, it changes over time and that doesn't make it kind of like less authentic or something because I believe re religions also change over time for reasons that are have a lot to do with kind of material conditions. Um, but, you know, jihad as it kind of emerges, on, um, you know, on the on the global scale, you know, say in the 1990s and then, of course, into the early 20th, uh, 21st century after 9-11 is not this medieval phenomenon. It is not, again, the resuscitation of path mo mod, uh, models or, or, or modes of being. It is this kind of very, very hypermodern thing. Um, and so in, as such, it actually can teach us a lot about the rest of the world. And so a big piece of this book is trying to move the conversation about jihad away from thinking that it's this very culturally specific um, phenomenon that really is just about Islam um, and showing all the ways in which when we look at jihad, we look at the kind of dynamics of contemporary jihad, we see things that look a lot like things that we see right here at home. Um, and that these, it exposes for us the kind of political and social dynamics that have revealed themselves uh, at this kind of moment of, um, you know, at, at, at this kind of fulcrum between, I think, two different, you know, basically world orders. Mm -hmm. um, and that jihad, uh, it, you know, it's it, much like kind of like, um, you know, I, I think of it as like kind of like form of like right wing authoritarianism, particularly in its like Islamic state guys. It's something that both registers a sense of disenchantment and uh, and uh, and a sense of uh, the delegitimacy, the, the kind of loss of legitimacy of this kind of existing like, you know, liberal order on the one hand. But on the other hand, can't really get beyond it because many of its foundational assumptions are still kind of steeped in that very same order that it critiques. So it has this kind of interesting relationship of both like mimicry and negation um, to the West, to kind of um, the kind of liberal project and particularly the neoliberal one. Um, so, you know, and, and I'll, maybe I'll give you like a, a few specifics to kind of bring Actually, us down from the theory. Like, before you yeah, do please. that, can I ask you to do something that uh, I often want done, which is to define the word neoliberal because the, the the meaning of the word has changed over the last few decades. It, it's it's a, it's achieved a whole new prominence yeah. within the last few years, it seems to me. And uh, I think I have a pretty clear idea of what people usually mean by it. But what do, what do you mean by the word by the like the neoliberal order or whatever? So I think about right neoliberalism is both a like a historical period. I think that's uh, useful, um, you know, roughly from the late seventies kind of onward. That more or less tra tracks the rise of kind of like a Reagan Thatcherite uh, ideology that would 
promote kind of, um, you know, free markets, um, right? And at least according to their own telling, a small government and the view that most social and political problems can be uh, can be solved through the marketplace and not through the kind of act of the work of politics, not through some sort of right real like concerted like democratic action. I, in my own work, kind of um, uh, take a little bit of a different approach to this, which is that uh, I think it's important not to take the small state stuff for granted um, because the neoliberal state is not small. The neoliberal state is redeployed. So the neoliberal state shrinks in terms of kind of social provision, welfare, you know, things like health care, like, you know, things that <laughs> like to, 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 to think that Richard Nixon was considering, you know, public daycare um, <laughs> at this point is just like to, to, to imagine an entirely different universe. Right. So the state shrinks in terms of social provision, but the state dr expands dramatically in terms of its like punitive functions. So in terms of military, police and prisons. Um, and so it's, it's, I think of it much more as a way that the state is redeployed um, and uses state violence to enforce an increasingly unequal uh, social order. And I gather there's a certain amount of emphasis on spreading that model globally, or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, that certainly, right, the kind of the, the, the early 90s, you know, triumphalism, um, you know, I, I, my, the book, title has this reference to the end of history. The, Francis you know, Fukuyama's famous declaration. Um, right, which is, a, it's like, a, you know, it's a great, just you can go back, you have to read the whole book, you can go back and read the article, um, you know, on, on the end of history, which I, I actually teach every, every year in my philosophy of history class. Um, and it's, right, this just sense of, the, this notion that the work of political thought was done. And that from here on out, all we needed was to administer our affairs. And it's just, a, it's just, it's a purely, it's a vision of politics reduced to kind of management and re reduced to kind of pure bureaucracy where all of the kind of questions of substance had kind of already been solved. Um, and right, this is an idea which has aged very poorly um, and which has, uh, you're right, uh, it seems as though history has restarted. Um, we, we, I think we can definitively say. Um, but that also it kind of registered this, um, this view of the world often associated with neoliberalism, right, that there's no alternative. And that's often associated with, right, Margaret Thatcher. Um, but the idea that there is no alternative to a political, social and economic order that most people find untenable, I think that that is, it, the, the effects of that are going to be destructive. And jihad is one response to the notion that there is no alternative. Uh, to say, oh, well, actually there is an alternative. It might be an otherworldly one. It might be an apocalyptic one. But right, the end of the world is, is one sort of alternative. And when you tell people over and over again that there's simply no way of arranging life differently to be more equitable and to be more fair, um, I think that they start looking for alternatives which are far more kind of radical and destructive. Mm -hmm. So you see jihad as both a response to, you know, in some cases, uh, what you might call an assertive uh, or even belligerent U.S. foreign policy, but in other cases, but also to some extent, just it's, kind of a, a discontent with the modern world. I, Is that... I, I mean, I think it's important. It's, listen, I'm, I'm no great defender of American foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, but I don't try to pin this all on right, American imperialism mm -hmm. or something like that. That's I think that it's much it's a much older story that we have to tell here about jihad and that it really a lot of it has to do with the dynamics in kind of states in the Middle East um, and, you know, North Africa and Central Asia in the kind of post-World War II period, um, where you which is the time if you're going to say, when does jihad change? Because, right, and if this is important to kind of underscore, um, uh, you know, for, for your listeners, that for most of its long history, jihad is a tool of the state. It is the way that Muslim right. states are supposed to wage war. It tells you who you can target, what weapons you can use, what you should use, what you should do with kind of people who are captured. The li literature on this is dry. It's juridical. It's like, right? It's like, it's, it's like very, very, very legalistic. Um, but it's uncontested that jihad is the right of the ruler. It's the right of the state. This is not something individuals go about doing. Right. Just like peasants don't declare war in, in, in medieval Europe. Like right. that is the prerogative of the state. Um, something radically, something shifts radically um, in the in the 20th century. Um, and if we're going to kind of uh, pin it on, uh, we, on, on a few, fig we can pin it on a few different figures as growing. But really, Said Qutb is this Egyptian thinker who's often associated with the Muslim Brotherhood as it's kind of one of its chief ideologues. Um, 
is the person who in the 50s and 60s puts forth most forcefully this notion that because the states and the rulers themselves are completely corrupt in this new kind of post-colonial order, they have forfeited their right to lead jihad. That these the, the Muslim rulers themselves are apostates, and as such, they cannot be they cannot fulfill this obligation. Mm-hmm. And even in the this has huge theological implications. So they argue that jihad is not as has been kind of regarded for you know um, most of Islamic history by the vast majority of Sunni jurists. It's not a collective obligation that would fall upon a society as a whole. It's something that each individual has to do themselves. Each individual has this kind of moral choice to make whether they are going to stand up against the kind of corrupt order or they're going to just kind of um, you know be sheep going along with it. So mm-hmm. Qutta really radically changes the kind of doctrine of jihad and cre- and makes it into a a kind of in, an insurgent tactic that's not the tool of states, but now it's directed mm-hmm. against states. And the first states that it's directed against are really right the states in the kind of in the Middle East itself. So it's Anwar Sadat being assassinated in kind of the early eighties, um, right? And and it's and the and jihad as an ideology has really matured, um, you know, after that kind of pivot in the fifties and sixties in this context of authoritarian states in the Middle East. Right. Um, uh, that are absolutely corrupt. That are absolutely despicable. Right. Um, and 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 that's why I said that jihad kind of registers this legitimation crisis. Um, that this order is not is not just and is not tenable. Right. Um, and it even has these very kind of again very liberal assumptions that undergird it. If you think about the way that Kutub is talking about individual responsibility, that it's not the responsibility of the state to do these things. It actually it all devolves to you, the individual. Right. If you think about the way that there's even a, there's a very like quasi democratic um, impulse here to say, well, the state uh, is is unjust and, and illegitimate because it oppresses its people. So you know it's 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 very very complex when you start looking at this to say that jihad and liberalism um, are are these oppositional right. forces because actually many of the ways in which jihad has kind of evolved over the 20th century is is quite indebted to liberal modes of thinking. Right. So okay. So. For starters, one thing people should appreciate is, uh, as, as you said, I mean, the idea of jihad evolved. And, and we should say, as a formal doctrine, it is, it is not found in the Quran, right? I mean, the word is found in the Quran. References to fighting, even, even exhortations to fight in certain circumstances may be found in the Quran. But the word jihad, there are also cases yes. where it means something else in the Quran. In any event, it's after the Quran uh, take shape after the age of Muhammad that you get uh, the the evolution of a big body of actual law reflecting the fact that that Islam you know was a state thing it, yes. it evolved as a state religion unlike say Christianity and yeah. uh, and so there, there's a whole body of law and as you say it's about the state's deployment of violence in war and 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 so. And it's a it's a radical thing, you know. And so when you get people like Osama bin Laden just showing up and saying, "Hey, I've decided I'm this important guy, and I'm going to declare jihad," he's picking up on this innovation uh, of this guy. What is it? Q U T B. I forget how you pronounce it. Said Qutb. Qutb, the Egyptian. He had, I gather, he had visited America and yes. and and had his own set of discontents with the West and maybe the modern world. But but um. But uh, there's a, there's an irony here, which is that uh, I remember early on when, when you know after 9/11, people are struggling with well, like what are we going to do with Islam? And there was there was a somewhat common idea that what we were seeing was an expression of just an ancient religion that hadn't come to terms with the modern world, and yeah. and what you uh, and, and this was the primordial Islam we were seeing expressing itself, and what you heard some people say, I remember is. Well, we just need Islam to go through its own reformation. And I thought, no, 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 <laughs> no, that's what's happened. It's yeah. it's like it's like the idea of these people taking it upon themselves to interpret a doctrine that traditionally had had only been interpreted within a large authoritative structure. Yeah. Um, See, it, that's it is, what's going on here. Is it there's a there's a breakdown of religious and political authority. There's a dual breakdown that kind of you know tracks throughout the 20th century. It starts earlier, but it definitely accelerates in the 20th century. Where yeah, the kind of old you know centers of institutional authority um, uh, for the kind of interpretation of Sharia uh, are, are are dissolved. And I mean, and there's and you can see this from so many you know perspectives. On the one hand. 
many of our most famous Islamists um, and kind of jihadists, um, you know, Osama bin Laden uh, included, um, uh, to uh, Zawakawi and Zawahiri, right? These are people, by and large, that are not the products of traditional Islamic education. They are doctors, they are engineers, there's a, a preponderance of engineers represented in kind of modern jihad ranks. Um, like it, 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 it's something that's so striking that's been actually studied in qualitative do you, terms. Do you have your own theory as to why that is? Yes, because it's the triumph of instrumental reason. Um, it is a kind of decoupling of science and technology from any sort of broader kind of humanistic or social concerns. Um, and that, that, however counterintuitively to Western ears, actually are communicated through the kind of traditional engagement with the Sharia. Um, that the, that, and, and what you see here, so this notion that these people are opposed to the modern world or that they're not from the modern world is just, it, it, it it's, it really needs to be debunked in the strongest terms because it undergirds and leads us to some kind of pretty faulty, um, you know, assumptions that, that, you know, continue to guide policy in many instances, right? If anything, they are more globalized, more modern <laughs> than we are. Um, and we, and, and yes, so whether that is the kind of very savvy use of like social media or the understanding of kind of the ways in which, right, online platforms can be used to facilitate these global communities um, that are both kind of uh, exclusionary in some sense, because, you know, it increasingly pulls people away from their immediate surroundings, but it also connects them with people kind of all over the world, mm -hmm. right? Like these people, have, I basically detached political identity from geography. So we want to talk about things that go beyond the nation state. I think that might be a very interesting place to start. Um, the kind of, I mean, just you go down the line and you find that, you know, there, the, this, again, the idea that they are not modern or opposed to the modern world is not only wrong, but it's, I mean, we have to then ask, given how demonstrably wrong this is, like, why do we keep wanting to say this? Like, what sort of important political or psychological work is it doing to say that these people are anti-modern or that they're, right. they don't come from the modern world? And right, I, think it's, I think it's consoling because then the problem isn't something within modernity itself. Uh -huh. The problem is that this is a leftover. Right. And yet you are saying, you're not saying that these are, you know, people in the throes of an ancient worldview can't come to terms with the modern world. But you are saying they're reacting to something in this world, in the modern world, some, something. Uh, and I guess one question is, how would you articulate what they're reacting to? And kind of relatedly, uh, was it almost inevitable that somebody would be reacting this way? And maybe if you pay attention, there are other people reacting kind of the way they are reacting to the circumstances of the world uh, as I we find them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we can look at right a bunch of different things. So we've already mentioned this kind of question of a, a legitimacy crisis, and I think that this is broad based. I don't think this is at all kind of uh, uh, um, you know constrained to the Islamic world, uh, but in some ways maybe these places, these countries are, are further ahead <laughs> than. But we are we are facing a legitimacy crisis in the United States at this moment, where the stories that have been told for decades are not broadly convincing to many many people. Can you drill um, down just a little like what what are the symptoms of that? What 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 are what's the old source of legitimacy Jan that's no January, longer accepted? January 6th is probably one of the, the best symptoms of this that we can find. The okay. entire move the entire um emergence of a kind of the the new right, whether we want to call them kind of an authoritarian right, a Trumpist right, a kind of the new nationalist, um, people who they register uh, a kind of a, a rejection, actually, of many of these neoliberal orthodoxies that have become kind of the party line, not just of the GOP, but of important parts of the Democratic Party as well, really from the kind of Clinton years onward. Um, the So you I think you, you know, you, you have like free this, trade or, or like free. Yes. So free trade, the idea that kind of or that you know that, that, that a world in which capital has maximal mobility and 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 preference and really privilege will eventually kind of raise all boats um uh, that this is a economic and kind of political order that's going to broadly work for everyone i mean i i see this I said i i i see this even when i talk to my parents right this kind of idea that all politicians are the same right they're all corrupt they're all self-serving right it's it's hard to kind of argue with this, but this what this registers is this massive sense of disenchantment um, and, the, and the sense that actually uh, the transformations that we might desire are not possible through traditional means. And that 
sense of disenchantment can do two things. Either it can send people kind of into complete escapist modes where they just want as little to do with it as possible, or they start looking to non-traditional means. So maybe the military could run the show better. Maybe we need a strong leader, mm-hmm. right? There's a sense that like the grinding wheels of democracy don't work, um, that it does not actually produce the society that we want. Um, and, and, and so I said, this legitimacy crisis is is I, is global as far as I can tell. This massive sense of kind of um, discontent with the status quo, um, and the question is going to be then: Yes, how do how do how do how do people respond to this? Um, and particularly in the Middle East, something that's important um, to explain the kind of uh, appeal I think of uh, kind of jihadism to even the, a, a tiny portion of the population is that you know over the from you know, pretty much the late 60s onward, I'm speaking very, very broadly here, of course, um, right, you have a, um, a kind of concerted attack on any sort of kind of leftist opposition uh, as these different regimes in the Middle, Middle East, some of which are kind of ostensibly supposed to be socialist, right, solidify their grip on power. And religion really becomes the only thing they cannot outlaw, uh, the only form of kind of political dissidence that cannot be criminalized. Um, and so you have the, you know, and, and, and this kind of, this, this, this accelerates as, you know, you have the kind of fall of the Soviet Union, you have even the kind of loss of any sort of kind of nominal patronage for any sort of like left movements in the Middle East. What is left? Your only alternatives that are left to this kind of bankrupt status quo are on the right. Mm-hmm. And so if you do not have a kind of, I think, like robust, more progressive alternative to a status quo that people find completely untenable, they are going to turn rightward. Uh, and I think that that is what's happened largely in the United States as well. Okay. So, uh, you know, when Osama bin Laden comes back uh, from Afghanistan, uh, where he has already, you know, encountered, I guess, a certain... Uh, you know, certain certain kinds of radicalizing influence. If he didn't go there with 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 them already at play, but anyway, he he comes back to Saudi Arabia, I gather, and he sees that uh, there are American military emplacements now that are themselves a legacy of the Persian Gulf War. Yes, and so you would say, I, I guess that although that certainly helps turn his attention to the United States, one of the things that most bothers him about what the United States is doing is kind of aiding and abetting the corruption of his own government. Right. The, in other words, the Saudi government should, it, it, it was a violation of their sacred yes. duty to let the troops in. And Yes. The, I, I think that, right, there is this kind of, there's a huge um, ideological divide within the ranks of kind of even like modern jihadists about um, uh, where one should direct your struggle. Should you attack these kind of the regimes on the ground, kind of, you know, close to home? So whether you're talking about Jordan or Saudi Arabia or we're talking about, you know, Egypt, uh, Libya, Tunisia, kind of uh, across the board, right? Is that this place, place of struggle? Or should you support or should you be attacking kind of uh, uh, the U.S.? Um, and kind of Western targets more broadly who are seen as kind of patrons of those regimes. Um, th- this is not something that like everyone was agreed on, right? There's plenty of people within the jihadi ranks who thought that the kind of decision to attack the United States was absolutely idiotic and kind of self-defeating from a strategic uh, perspective. Um, so, you know, certainly for bin Laden, these things kind of, right, they can go together, but I want to, I almost want to back up though, because I think it's almost giving him too much credit to attribute to him some sort of great geopolitical strategy. And that's something that I, I find actually the most like modern and like again, hyper-modern about him was that it wasn't that he had a kind of list, a, a, a concrete list of political demands and like, you know, real pragmatic goals that he hoped to accomplish. Um, the kind of the attacks of 9-11 and many of those have kind of come after have really devolved into spectacle. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are meant to be seen. They are meant to be watched. They are now meant to be shared. They are meant to be commented upon. They're, they're meant to be dissected kind of 24 seven on news media. Does it change things in material terms? Um, I mean, certainly a, a, in an adverse way for many of the kind of, you know, people on the ground, uh, it, it absolutely did. But the, right, the, the, the world, you know, the idea that bin Laden thought he was going to like, I don't know, create some sort of, you know, they bring America to his knees and, you know, completely right. realign align our foreign policy. He wasn't going to land troops on the East Coast. Uh, no, right? That, but And so then you that, again, signals that like this type of violence is something different. And we can't assume that this is just something that has always existed. What type of violence is it that is chiefly concerned with spectacle? 
Like, how did that become the thing that our politics is about? Um, but again, once we start asking the questions in those registers, we leave the tightly bound world of Islam and we start seeing that there are echoes of these, um, uh, of these phenomena in, 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 in the U.S. and kind of, you know, more globally. And what are you hoping people will conclude in the way of answering that question? <laughs> like, what, what does it say? Or like, what, what, do you, what do you wish like America's kind of, you know, uh, governing class or whatever or would take uh, from this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, how, how would they answer that question now that you've got their attention with, with a good uh, question? Well. Like, why? <laughs> why do we why did we you know, because it was described as an attack. I remember the New York Times headline U.S. attacked. And I remember thinking, well, kind of, but not the way we used to mean that with New York Times headlines, right? Yeah. Like like when a country is attacked, it's not an the actual kind of threat that used to signify. I remember kind of wondering about that, but then thinking, well, they did. Look, they tried to, it's an act of war. There's no doubt about that. So I, I guess I kind of left it there. How are you hoping the conversation would ideally evolve, uh, you know, toward, toward what conclusion are you trying to lead people? Us? Not, well, yeah said, I, I always say that his, historians have very fuzzy crystal balls and we kind of don't do policy almost as a, <laughs> as a, as a rule. But I think having kind of um, uh, been working through this material for many years and then kind of seeing some of its reverberations domestically, I think that people really do need substantive avenues of political participation. I think that people need robust communities. Um, I think that re like social alienation is a real problem here, um, but that people need to also feel like they have agency, that they have that what they do can matter in the world. And what's so fascinating about, you know, the kind of, um, if you look at like the Islamic State more recently, uh, the way that they appeal, the way that they attracted 40,000, you know, foreign fighters is because they hold out this notion that what you do actually makes a difference. And so against this kind of growing sense of apathy and disenchantment and, uh, and, and, and right, like my mother, that like everything's always just terrible and it's never going to change. Mm -hmm. Right. That is a very demobilizing message. And I think that groups that hold out a, um, a, a, a message that actually there are, so there is something you can do. You have real agency here and that there are substantive um, paths of civic participation, that that is actually something that people are looking for. And again, who is going to offer that? We have to make our, you know, just to kind of constrain our conversation for, for a moment to the U.S., Right? We have to actually reinvigorate our kind of politics to be genuine and participatory um, in order to give people a sense of some sort of agency. Because to go to the ballot box every two to four years to vote for somebody who probably isn't going to do anything that's going to change your life dramatically, like this is what the kind of hollowed out shell of our democracy has become. And what I am trying to indicate is that this is a um, right that this is a this is a dangerous path. And that absent some sort of alternative on the left, absent some sort of like real robust democratic politics um, that hand, that holds out the chance of kind of participation and change, but that also acknowledges the real bankruptness of the status quo and why it's untenable for so many people. Absent that, people are going to go to the right. They're going to go to Trump. They're going to go to Holly. They're going to go to the kind of new nationalists um, because at least they will acknowledge that people are suffering. Um, and, and, and so I, I kind of, I think that, you know, again, the comparisons here are not, are, are not exact and I don't want to, you know, pretend that they are, but when I'm like looking at this kind of crisis of legitimacy that has occurred in the Middle East, I'm looking at the sense of kind of widespread despair and kind of disenchantment with the kind of political status quo, and then looking at jihad as a response to that, um, right. This, I think this is a, this can be like a, a little bit more of a warning sign than something that's just constrained to the Middle East or it's just about Islam. Okay. Let me, let me just read uh, a, a sentence from your book and see if there's anything else in there you want to pick up on. Sure. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a big sentence. It, it covers a lot. <laughs> Sorry. We find that across the globe, a series of changes are occurring that make violence less democratic, states more fragmented, knowledge less esteemed, identity more exclusive, and politics more fraught. Um, I, actually, let me ask you about, I do want to give you a chance to pick up on it, but I do want to yeah. uh, ask you about the identity more exclusive, exactly yeah. what you mean by yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's, right, it's very fascinating to see, um, right, we, 
Okay, let me back up for a second. People often assume that, you know, things like genocides or ethnic cleansings, again, are like the, um, uh, uh, the reactivation of ancient hatreds that come and reassert themselves um, and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, tear these countries apart. But, right, our real historical work would show that, no, most of these are really products of the 19th and 20th century. They come, by and large, uh, in the age of nationalism, in the age of kind of modernism, um, and that often when kind of new states are coming into being, um, or so like India, a partition of India and Pakistan, uh, for instance, is, is a kind of a case in this. Um, but right, there, there, there are many others as well. And why is that the case? Well, because for the nation state, a heterogeneous population is a liability and a problem in a way that it wasn't for kind of the old imperial models who, right, they think kind of about your Habsburgs or your Ottomans, these kind of famous, you know, this is why they're so kind of famous and sometimes even idealized today for their cosmopolitanism, because you had these people, these are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, right, so on and so forth. Like the natural diversity of, 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 of humanity did not seem to be a problem for these empires, uh, because it didn't assume some sort of direct correspondence between the people who are in charge and the people below. Right, which is what the notion of popular sovereignty that the nation state is built off of. Right? So the wait, real- let me just be clear. Was it yes. because a, a degree of almost ethnic hierarchy was accepted then that they could get away with it? I, so I don't think it was ethnic hierarchy in many of these instances. It was a sense of not having right that even the notion that again ethnicity uh, that you needed to have all the people had to be of the same ethnic makeup in order to be glued together politically. Like this is a modern idea. This is not an old imperial idea. The, the, certainly the rulers in each of these countries, are they're, can, they're related to one another. Who cares if they're related to the people on the ground or they have any commonality with the people on the ground? You know, think about the kind of, if you've ever examined a, um, a family tree of, you know, right. kind of European royal families. Like Germans right? marry British. <laughs> the relationships and, are yeah. horizontal across the very top of the ruling class. The right. mixed mass below them, who cares? The, the notion that there should be, again, some sort of correspondence ethnically between the people who are ruling and the people on the ground, like that is not an idea that kind of uh, accompanies these kind of old monarchic or uh, imperial traditions. But I mean, a, ethnicity starts kind of feeling yeah. its oats as early as the formation of nationalism, though, right? Like, in, I, I mean, the, 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 the Habsburgs had to deal, I mean, famously, yeah, World War I uh, involved that. And, in, and in, the, in the 19th century, when you, it's really the kind of heyday of nation state formation, the sort of um, diversity of, you know, people living under a single, um, you know, uh, political system, this becomes a problem. This becomes a liability in a way that it had not. Okay. And I, you know, I have, um, I, let's see if I can actually find it because it's a it's a it's a great little kind of uh, it's a great kind of quote to kind of situate this that we have um, you know kind of beginning of the 19th century kind of you have these kind of German romantics talking about how you know Herder in particular talking about how a state that has multiple you know nations um, right here it is right now right. Nothing seems more contradictory to the true end of governments and the endless expansion of states, the wild confusion of races and nations under one scepter. An empire made up of 100 peoples and 120 provinces which have been forced together is a monstrosity, not a state body. This is right, Herder and, writing at the beginning of the 19th century. And your point is that's kind of new. That's kind that of is new. new. This is like a new idea coming into being that p- people who are different cannot inhabit the same political space. Um, and, and and would you say that that idea has more or less continuously uh, not grown in strength, but manifested itself at almost a, uh, an increasingly fine grained level? I mean, th- this is a critique of America today, of course, is that yeah. it, it's gotten ridiculously microscopic in, in its manifestation, right? So I think that this, I mean, yes, yeah, so I think that this has kind of continued to, to, to today. I mean, it, it undergirds a lot of kind of, you know, present national um, kind of thinking. People like uh, Yoram Hazoni, who's kind of very interested in kind of, you know, uh, extolling the virtues of nationalism it, on the premise that in order for states to stay together, they have to be kind of glued together and they're an extension of the family, right? So whether we want to say that's in racial or ethnic terms, right, this is a, a, a kind of idea that powers much of the thinking about nationalism today is that you can't just have what the United States is, for instance, right? Uh, people from all sorts of different backgrounds kind of bound together by, um, by, by an agreement to follow the same laws, 
This is a, you know, um, you know it's, it's a different idea of what holds the state together. Can the state just be held together by people who agree to live together and follow the same body of law? Or does, do you need something like organic or quote unquote natural? You know, so either, yeah, race, ethnicity, religion, some kind of combination um, thereof. So, so this is all a kind of a long preamble, but which is to say that, right, today's kind of jihad reflects this very, very exclusive notion of who is in and who is out of the political community. But it takes it to the next level, which is that even most Muslims are not actually kind of really Muslim, uh, according to the logic of a group like the Islamic State, um, that, you know, they have kind of been cast outside the bounds. Um, and so on the one hand, there's this notion of uh, identity, which is, um, which is you know, potentially global, which is, it is, you know, that there are kind of true believers everywhere. But on the other hand, most actually existing Muslims are not true believers. They are kind of outside the community. So it's this very interesting tension of something that's both like expansive on the one hand mm -hmm. and a very narrow um, and exclusionary uh, on the other hand. Um, but right, this whole notion about like who's really in and who's really out of the political community and the idea that you have to be you have to be fully in, you have to be recognized as kind of one of their own in order to be part of the political community. Um, right, this is the general thinking of nationalism. And I think it's very it's it's very destructive um, for all the obvious reasons that you know people talk about when we think about um, new nationalism and kind of racism and xenophobia. But I think it signals something even darker, which is the I, um, the kind of pivot away from really the realm of politics. So we don't have this and and right that politics is no longer a sphere where we where people who are different go together to hash out those differences and kind of create some sort of kind of compromise positions that are going to rule society. Because politics in that form has already been so gutted, I think that we're left with this notion that politics can only be administration. And administration is much easier if you've already eliminated difference as much as possible in advance. Um, so it, there's, a, it, there's a, a kind of way then in which this view of, um, of the exclusive you know, identity kind of does parallel and kind of complement a, a neoliberal turn where politics is kind of gutted. Um, and and transformed into a project of management or administration. Okay. So to get back to Osama bin Laden, I mean, I guess you would say, uh, I, I mean, maybe I guess I, I, I'd want you to elaborate a little on the connection between his perception of the illegitimacy of his state, yep. Saudi Arabia, and Americans' seemingly growing perception of the illegitimacy of their state and and in your view kind of trumpism among other things being a reflection of that um i mean that's not just a coincidence right they, they are on the one hand those are very different contexts it's not like saudi arabia had a tradition of liberal democracy no. that had once drawn widespread adherence and was now in doubt i mean they they got to their perceived illegitimacy through, uh, in some ways, a very different path than America got to its. Absolutely. But, are, but, but do you see some common underlying root causes well, there or some connection? Well, there's certainly connection, right? They're not the same. Their dynamics are, 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 are distinct, but, right, they, yes, they kind of, we do end up with this kind of critique of the prevailing order um, in both instances. For bin Laden, for, uh, for jihadists, kind of, uh, you know, more broadly, the problem stems from this kind of, ultimately, the kind of question of sovereignty. Who is going to be the sovereign? Um, and that there's, you know, uh, there, there's a kind of dual critique of the prevailing political models that jihadists will put forth. That on the one hand, monarchies or these kind of like tyrannical uh, kind of dictators uh, that kind of, you know, throughout the region, that they make themselves a lord over everyone else. Essentially, they have elevated themselves, their their words, their their judgments to the level of like a, a quasi-divine figure. So there's something idolatrous about the ways in which kind of a monarch would make, make the law. And on the other hand, there's a critique of democracy and popular sovereignty, uh, because popular sovereignty is also says that it's the people who can make the law. Mm -hmm. And the Islamist retort is that no, 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 the law is already given. Right, Sharia is given, it's perfected. All we have to do is administer it. Again, we see this the echo of the administrative state. It's not, it's, it is not a coincidence because this is not a traditional way of thinking about Sharia. Sharia is not a ready made system of like legal codes that you can just plop down. Uh, and the idea that it doesn't require human interpretation or application 
is a very modern one that's advanced by Islamists and pretty much nobody else. Like the, you know, this is not a traditional Islamic idea that the kind of Sharia is simple and just like a ready-made system of laws. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's fascinating to see that yes, they have this. So you know, this is where this kind of critique is coming from in like the Bin Laden or the jihadist um, angle is it, this question of sovereignty of who really gets to make the law, um, and they reject laws made by humans ostensibly all the while ignoring that Sharia is also largely a legal system that it ends up being made by humans mm -hmm. um, because it is only through human interpretation that it has any sort of um, uh, application in the world. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't know. It just doesn't leave me in a state of great hope. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, uh, you know... It, it, and and there's just so many things going on. I mean, the the technological change alone is is you know kind of radical, and and it's a change that disorients people on the one hand. It it undermines some traditional systems of gov governance, including some things that worked well about democracy. Um, it gives uh, people who who want to express themselves radically new tools. Uh, and I guess you you acknowledge kind of all that. It's but but you're not you're not a, a kind of technological determinist, right? You're you're not. No, I mean I think that at the end of the day, like technology, right? It it can it it, it can go both ways. It is not kind of an absolute good or kind of an absolute uh, evil. However much my like children will make fun of me that I can't like figure out how to like you know do things on my phone. <laughs> like I'm a little bit of a luddite in that sense, but the. Right. And, and you see this kind of the, the whiplash with Twitter, for instance, it's like a great uh, instance of this. So in 2011, Twitter is the it, it's the it's it's the kind of savior of democratic revolutions and a way of organizing for the Arab Spring. It is going to bring down dictators. It's going to be this new way of people to kind of connect, to share information and to mobilize. And then in the right Twitter of 2021 or 2022, right, 10 years later, Twitter is this massive threat to our democracy that kind of um, uh, kind of gives platforms to people spreading conspiratory conspiracies and kind of disinformation and kind of uh, is echo chambery and kind of divides people into camps and kind of, you know, makes everything about our politics worse. Now, I probably actually am a little bit more on, you know, the, the, the latter of those visions of what Twitter is, but like, I don't think that either of these takes is, 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 is true in the absolute. Um, and that, you know, the kind of, um, you know, that we can't like that t technology is, 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 is necessary for human flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, that technological advances are necessary for kind of, um, you know, kind of any sort of kind of development that we've had thus far and in, in, in any sort of sustainable development into the future. It's a question as to who harnesses those powers and for what end. Um, and so I think it's kind of it's 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 dissatisfying because it's neither the like techno utopianism of Silicon Valley nor the kind of pure Luddite per, uh, perspective. But this notion that these things are kind of like they're both end. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to kind of fight to make them what we want them. Yeah. Let me uh, go back to, uh, you, you said that uh, in general, the crisis of legitimacy in terms of the perceived legitimacy of the state is going to uh, be reflected in a turn to, to the right. And you see Trumpism as an example. Of course, people on the right think the big movement has been uh, on the left. They would, I don't know if you saw this, yeah. there was a famous uh, cartoon, you know, Elon Musk uh, embraced this cartoon. Did you see this? It was a left-right spectrum cartoon. No. And it was, it was done by this guy, Colin Wright, who's kind of an intellectual, he's a Quillette, intellectual yeah. dark web type figure. And, and, and the point was, uh, you know, you had this right and this left defined on the political spectrum and the Colin Wrights and Elon Musk of the world were maybe just left of center and then the left end of the spectrum moved, and suddenly the Colin Wrights and Elon Musk of the, of the world were being accused of being on the right because the left side had moved so far to the left. And I think what they have in mind is, is the identity politics left more than the socialist left. And actually, that's something yeah. we could get into. But first, I want to just yeah. say there are a lot of people on the right who would say, you've got it exactly wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that actually the, the reaction, 
uh, you know, whatever whatever is being reacted to by the political world is showing up as as a movement to the 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 left, and and they're talking about something that you do take account of. We talked about how you see what's called identity politics is in a certain sense a continuation of a longstanding trend that you take account of uh, going back at least as far as the evolution of of nationalism, kind of. But anyway, what would you say to those people who say? No, actually, the big freak out is people going to the left in response to the modern world. I mean, I think that I mean, certainly I know that the, the, that those opinions kind of exist. Right. The um, And right. Um, uh, but I'm always wary of talking about these things purely at the level of like ideology or like, quote unquote, social issues, um, because actually the. I, I'm a materialist thinker. I think that our ideologies and our social issues evolve um, in, in kind of in response and kind of, you know, um, in, in, in a relationship to our material and economic conditions. And that um, the material and economic front, right, we are, the, the, the goalposts have moved so far to the right as a kind of result of this neoliberal realignment, you know, from the late 70s onward. Again, guys, Richard Nixon, publicly funded daycare. Just say those words and see how they kind of go down thinking about today's kind of political alignments where that has not even been a kind of, you know, a, a political suggestion of, you know, anyone in the mainstream Democratic Party. So the, you know, I think that the goalposts have moved very, very, very far to the right um, in terms of the things that um, that are a kind of right the kind of material concerns of kind of everyday life and i think that the left or the democrats this however we want to kind of um characterize them because they are fundamentally unwilling to move to readjust those goalposts and and to actually move further left uh, on kind of the economic front and to move further into kind of real social democratic territory because they are unwilling to do that they put all of their eggs in the kind of baskets of, um, uh, of of what are kind of, you know, broadly and perhaps erroneously called like social issues. So mm -hmm. whether it was gay marriage or kind of, you know, um, uh, now kind of abortion, which again, I, I dislike this framing term vastly, but I think abortion is a social reproduction issue. I think it's an economic issue. Um, but that they, that, and a lot of the kind of virtue signaling, I mean, that kind of, right, there is a way in which you have the, you know, when you have kind of the NFL or major corporations kind of talking about, right, it's kind of often critiqued as this kind of like woke capitalism. Um, you know, saying that they stand against kind of racism X, Y, or Z, but they're at the end of the day unwilling to imagine a economic system in which they did not have all of the kind of privileges and profits that they do that would actually function for some real redistribution, which I think is, again, crucial to some sort of anti-racist work. I think in lieu of making those more substantive shifts, the kind of democratic line has been to kind of just lean into the um, in, in, into the issues as ideology, as if kind mm -hmm. of being an anti-racist is just something that you wake up in the morning and decide you're going to do, rather than something that would require the complete rearrangement of our um, our economy and politics and society as well. Okay, so there is. Uh, but I wait, mean, can I add one thing? Sure. I, I don't think most people. I mean. Said I, we, you, 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 you do this for a living. Uh, I'm, I'm a historian and kind of political theorist. I don't think most people in the United States um, have a kind of view of a right-left spectrum in mm -hmm. their minds that they're thinking about. Uh, I think that's the way that kind of politicians speak and often kind of academics and pundits think. We think about moving to the left and moving to the right as if it's this like long line. Right. Right. And people kind of position themselves in one place. And if maybe if somebody moves in one direction or another along this line, then, you know, the average Joe's kind of positions might change and that might be kind of come into his orbit and become attractive. I just don't think that's the way that most people think about their politics in this kind of like pure spectrum sort of way. Oh, right. Um, like, like, I mean, suppose you uh, suppose Biden had said something like I'm going to you know, some partial movement on healthcare, like, okay, I, I think Medicare should kick in at age 45. You'd probably have more than a few Trump voters who said, like, that sounds, sounds okay. Good. That would be <laughs> a relief. Good to me. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, we, we know that these things kind of, like, poll very popular, that they have a lot of support when they're kind of as, as issues themselves. Right. Once they get um, uh, right, if you ask people, what do they think about universal health care? If you ask people what they think about, like, you know, subsidized child care, if you ask people about what, you know, they think about what, you know, Green New Deal things like there's there, there these things are far more popular at the kind of mm. polling level 
than kind of the mainstream democratic politics would suggest because they act as though these things are going to kind of, you know, somehow alienate, um, you know, this, this, um, you know, the kind of moderates and conservatives who, again, according to the spectrum thinking, are already really far to the right. And anything that we do, um, you know, to the left of that is, is going to alienate them. Um, but I think these constellations look a little bit distinct. If you remember that most people don't think about their political positions in terms of that line. Mm -hmm. So there is, as we alluded to this, uh, there is on the left this uh, a kind of tension between what kind of the the right, the Republican Party depicts as the left, which is to say the identity politics left kind of, as they might call it. Uh, and and on the other hand, the more traditional, I don't know if you want to say socialist, Marxist, or you don't have to say that, but but class-based yes. uh, well, left, which, a which left emphasizes, the right, that, that yeah. which says, you know, uh, focus on helping lower income people, the working class, whatever, and and you'll find that that helps people of various races and, and so on. And, and there's a risk to being too divisive along racial lines if you want to unify people along lines of class. Anyway, there's that whole thing. Uh, there, there, there is the, the class-based left, which in some forms is grounded in a, uh, I mean, a Marxist worldview, not necessarily in the sense of, of espousing a communist world, but in the sense of being, as, as you said, kind of materialist in the way they see the world working, right? Like, uh, you know, in, in, in full-blown Marxism, there's this tendency to see all of these kind of highfalutin ideas and, and, and so on and religious concepts as being in some sense a reflection of what's going on at the material level. level. And, and, I, and I gather it's safe to say that uh, you identify at least to some extent with the class-based left, which I'm sure you would hasten to add, doesn't mean you're dismissing all concerns of so-called identity politics, but you, you, yes. you, you clearly- I'm a, I'm, a I'm, a, I'm a materialist thinker. And I- for Right, certain... and, and that's what I wanted to get, get, to get back to the thesis of the book is it's, it, it is grounded in a kind of materialism in that sense, right? You, you want us to appreciate the senses in which the things we don't like about the world, including- uh, you know, oh. terrorism and so on are ultimately reflections of material forces, and the, and and that maybe uh, you know, kind of facts on the ground that maybe you should focus on at a policy level if you want the world to be more to your liking. Is that right? I think that's I think that's generally fair, um, and that you know, I I and I again, there's there's a there's a lot of ways in which um, you know people can be materialist or historical materialist. Um, I really, I'm kind of, if I'm going to give my like lineage, right, I'm a Frankfurt School thinker. So I'm in, in, in the kind of, um, uh, kind of in a school of thought that really people who try to take real like cultural formations very seriously as, uh, as, as sites where power is also expressed, not just something that's kind of like, uh, you not know, just epiphenomenal. Yes, it's not just like an after the fact sort of thing. Right. But I think I try to broadly be um, concerned with how kind of, right, how cultures evolve in some sort of dialectical relationship, um, you know, with kind of material conditions on the ground. Um, and, right, we see this again with, with, with and, and I don't, right, we see this with kind of the history of jihad. How is it that jihad goes from being the prerogative of the states to something that is taken up by every individual in this like vigilante form? Like, mm -hmm. that's a massive theological, uh, you know, transformation. And there are, and, and it's, and it's complex and there's going to be a variety of different tools that we have to deploy in order to explain it. But at least mm -hmm. some of those have to be embedded with the kind of material shifts that, you know, and, and that, uh, on the ground. So yes, this is, I, I think that there's a relationship between these things, not necessarily that it's like, one, you know, it's, and it's not determinist, right? right? It's not like material conditions X produces social conditions Y, um, but there is a kind of almost like cyclical relationship between these things. And you're saying once this has happened and ideas evolve in response to material conditions, the ideas do matter in and of themselves. And you can you can have the contest at the level the contest at the level of ideas matters to some extent. In other words, yeah, people actually yeah. arguing yeah. with Osama I, bin Laden about like where he gets his authority and stuff or whatever. Because the right because it, it right it can those ideas can come back and then influence the material world and the way right. that people kind of move through move through the world and act. But I think that, you know, to bring it back for a second to kind of the question of like a, some sort of robust, you know, democratic policies, I think that, you know, the Democrats uh, 
are, you know, tend to be very, very ideological. Um, and mm-hmm. I mean that in that like um, real like old Hegelian and Marxist way, meaning that they think that ideas are the moving force behind kind of human history and behind kind of even, you know, contemporary politics so we'll kind of <laughs> to constrain ourselves a little bit. Um, and that, right, so you have Joe Biden will talk, sit there and talk about the importance of people having, you know, unity and, you know, kind of healing and getting over these, you know, this divisiveness. These are all kind of like these, like, you know, uh, you know um, emotional states um, that are almost supposed to be, I think, like free floating and people are supposed to embrace them because they're moral or they're virtuous, but that without necessarily changing anything material about their lives. And I think that that thinking is very, very, uh, uh, is very faulty, that we can't just kind of engineer these kind of, you know, emotional or social states without some sort of kind of corresponding material shifts. Um, and that to think that we could do so would be, again, to operate kind of purely at the level of ideology, where everything is a moral choice that individuals must make, whether they're going to be good, whether they're going to be bad, essentially, right? Um, as opposed to thinking about the ways in which material conditions enable us to make different choices. Mm-hmm. Um, as those conditions shift, so too do the possibilities for different kind of you know social and emotional states. Okay. So uh, I guess we should, uh, we've been talking a while, we should... <laughs> Start to wrap it up. I, I did want to just quickly touch on something you mentioned and maybe drive it home a little. It it, it sounds like your view of, um, well, uh, I guess, I don't know if identity politics is the term, but the idea, there there is an idea that, uh, well, you see this on the, on the Trump right, and you, in a way, maybe you see a version of it on the left. The idea that ethnic tribalism is this primordial force that mm-hmm. uh, that maybe is suppressed here and there uh, by liberal ideals or by universalist ideals or something, but that this is uh, actually a natural thing that inevitably will that's will win to, out. And and, yeah. uh, and and I think you're saying that's a misunderstanding of the history. It's just interesting to me that that, that kind of parallels your argument about jihad. There is this idea that this is the pure expression of a suppressed ancient, uh, you know, the the primordial form of Islam uh, or something. You're saying that's almost 180 Wait. degrees wrong. It's certainly wrong. The, you're, you're making kind of, you, you, you're, there's a parallel between your yeah. views of these two things, right? I mean, usually you only have to dig back a few decades to find that the political and social arrangements that we now take for granted didn't used to prevail. Um, and that indicates that they are not kind of eternal, that they are not kind of just always lying kind of latent waiting to manifest, but that they are the products of cultivation, um, uh, you know, in sometimes even coercion. Um, and that we have to understand the forces that make these, t- these types of politics attractive at different, you know, at different points. Um, you know, there's a there's so many wonderful historical kind of case studies on this. Um, you know, uh, Mary Calder's work on old wars and new wars, which I kind of draw on a lot in my book, kind of tracks this with regard to kind of the wars in Bosnia, for instance, in the 1990s, which were often explained as the kind of, um, uh, you know, resurfacing or kind of bubbling up to the surface of these primordial ethnic hatreds. And mm-hmm. she kind of shows all of the ways in which that argument is just not true. And it, right, that the, whether you look at like rates of intermarriage or the percentage of people who wanted to ban nationalist parties because they thought they were like, you know, unruly and divisive. Um, And that the, right, we instead have to see, not that these identities aren't real or that people don't experience them as as, as genuine, um, but that they are activated and kind of cultivated for specific reasons at specific times. Um, uh, and that there are different modes of community that we can cultivate um, in, in response and in opposition to them. This is not the only way that it has to be. Mm-hmm. There's usually somebody who's interested is in to... Uh to kind of energize those kinds of impulses, usually somebody with some power or somebody who wants more power, but it's not like they they just yeah. organically and naturally express themselves in the form yes. of tribal hatred. And, and I think that history is our is our friend here uh, in helping us understand often the recency of these uh, kind of alliances and configurations that are kind of deemed essential or eternal. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I, I do I say it's it's history's only self is knowing that things are not always the way that they were now, uh, and they don't have to remain this way in the future. Okay. 
Well, thank you. So the book is The Apocalypse and the End of History, Modern Jihad and the Crisis of Liberalism. And you're at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. You want to say just a word or two about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, what's going on there? It, it's, uh, where Absolutely. is it? It's, it must be in Brooklyn. It is in Brooklyn. We are headquartered uh, actually in Dumbo, but our model is which to is, bring- Which is an acronym for Down Under the Manhattan, Manhattan Bridge or something? Bridge. Yes, yeah. overpass. Um, we- our model is to bring kind of academic uh, conversations and scholarly work into the public sphere. So we've, we're about 10 years old now, and we hold um, kind of like liberal arts style seminars, uh, um, uh, you know, throughout New York City and really now in the age of Zoom beyond and, and truly worldwide. Um, we have, you know, a, a global faculty at this point. We teach almost 200 courses a year mm. that are kind of four weeks in duration on everything from history and politics and literature and poetry and design and kind of, uh, you know, political theory and philosophy to like theoretical mathematics. And, you know, uh, I mean, if you can imagine it, <laughs> it's a liberal arts and science discipline. We probably teach it. We about 70 faculty members right now. Um, and uh, the again, the, the model is very much trying to take uh, conversations that we view as is really important um, to public life more broadly, taking them out of a kind of sequestered university realm and bringing them back into the public sphere. Okay. And where can people find you on social media? Are you on Twitter? Uh, reluctantly and, and not very frequently. Um, I'm uh, at, oh, this is as embarrassing. I think- You I don't think even I'm, know your Twitter I, handle? I think I'm this at- This is so shameful. <laughs> I think I'm at Suzy, S-U-Z-Y, uh -huh. under, underscore Schneider. Um, but well, if you're you, not, I'm sure somebody worthy is, so they should definitely <laughs> follow that person. You might have to double check that. I am not on Facebook. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I, yeah. I, again, I, I already hinted that my children think I'm a Luddite, and this might really give me away. I think, yeah, I think we can pretty much <laughs> close the case here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Bob.